concrete is a word that we use a lot in our lives. And the origin of the word, I wouldn't tell you what the origin is in the original language, but uh, uh, if you Google it or go to a dictionary, you'll find that's kind of bringing things together in a sound and strong concrete. And we still use it even outside of uh, materials and engineering in sound and concrete ideas or foundational uh, theologies or uh, ideologies or whatever. But today we are into the real application of concrete in construction. And uh, this presentation is a part of revolutions in science and technology paradigms. Now, uh, this is part of the first Eastern Illinois University uh, Symposium on Technology and Society. And I am sure you will concretely uh, enjoy this presentation presented by the chair of the School of Technology at Eastern Illinois University, Dr. Austin Cheney. He is my chair also. I work at the School of Technology. So without much ado, please welcome Dr. Austin Cheney, concrete. Thank you, Dr. Wuf I want to thank Dr. Wafiq Wabi for the opportunity to present here today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, revolution in science and technology that happened because of the development of Portland cement. Um, so it's a concrete advantage as we know cement is a main ingredient of making concrete and uh, this uh, invention revolutionized the construction world. So let me talk about that a little bit today. First thing I'm going to do is give a little bit of a history of concrete construction and how it happened over time in the early years. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the development of Portland cement and the time period that that happened and then give you an idea of the breadth of applications of cement-based products, primarily concrete, but it's also used in other applications as well, um, and give you an opportunity to ask any questions. So one of the things that everybody's aware of is the pyramids. And there's a long-standing accepted belief that these uh, pyramids were constructed of stone that was hewn, that was quarried and hewn uh, in Egypt. So I'll give you an idea of what the mainstream theory is of pyramid construction. In the theory video, we showed the basic principles of getting the massive limestone blocks from the quarry all the way up to the pyramid construction side and then up the side of the pyramid using flotation in simplistic terms. But in reality, if a water lift extended from the ground to the top of the pyramid with only a gate at the top and at the bottom, the water lift would break because of the huge pressures created by the weight of so much water. To combat this, Chris proposes multiple gated locks in 50 foot segments, extending up the water shaft. The upshot of doing this is that each section would only be subjected to about two bars of water pressure. Also, this would decrease the compression of the floats used to lift the blocks of the shaft. in threes and fours between each set of locks. see one theory that's been proposed and widely accepted actually. You find that a lot in your education that oftentimes theories that we've come up with and there's not 
proof of that theory are presented as if they're fact. Theory of evolution is a perfect example. It's taught in the classroom as fact. They're disputing alternative hypotheses out there. Similarly, with the pyramids, there is an alternate hypothesis proposed uh, by a fellow by the name of Joseph Davidovitz. <laughs> and uh, uh, basically, he says that those blocks were actually made out of concrete rather than hewn out of stone. So they took soft limestone with a very high Kaolinite content. Now, Kaolinite is basically a clay. So I had a high clay content, and those are mixed with lime and natron. Now, I'm going to play a short video that describes a little bit about this theory um, and uh, shows how it uh, has potential validity. In September of 2002, our Geopolymer Institute crew cast massive imitation pyramid blocks. Or perhaps you should say genuine pyramid blocks. We used the same kind of earthen ingredients available to the ancient Egyptians 4,500 years ago. These massive blocks have the same chemical makeup and appearance as blocks of the Great Pyramid. The limestone we used consists of fossil shells called pneumilites, like those in the Giza bedrock. Like in Giza, our French limestone is so loosely bound it doesn't require crushing. But unlike in Giza, it contains no kaolin clay. We heap the cement additives, lime, natron and kaolin clay, near the limestone. The two components will react in the water and will institute a geological glue which will then yield <coughs> the hard geopolymeric rock agglomerated limestone. We start making the cement by mixing sodium carbonate, found in Egyptian natron, and lime in 500 liters of water. We then add the kaolin, inherent to Giza limestone, and stir the mix with a wooden tool. We dump one ton of limestone rubble into the basin and mix it with the cement. Several days later, water has evaporated from the basin so we remove the disaggregated limestone for making the block. Inspecting the mixture, 95% limestone aggregates and only 5% rock making binder. Between 12 and 17% of water give it the consistency of wet sand. One squeezes the mixture with his hand and it keeps its shape. This batch will quickly gain strength. We do all of the work manually, forming a human shape, carrying buckets from the mixing area to the mold. We pour the limestone concrete mixture in a mold and pack it down with a tool called a rammer. Compacting the material requires little effort. The packing operation encourages cohesion and the denser mixture takes on high strength from the initial curing phase. When the climate is warm and beautiful, our crew rapidly produces a reagglomerated limestone that proved strong, dense and true to the plant's size and shape. The mold consists of small wooden boards, which can be reused many times for making other blocks. In this ideal weather, the whole process runs smoothly and is very simple. We remove the mold four hours later. The synthetic limestone looks like a natural stone. We observe no trace of wood grain. Four blocks have already been made. Joseph Davidovitz presents them. The two large blocks weighing up to 4.5 tons, containing most water, have given smoother surfaces. The two small blocks weighing up to 1.3 tons, the least wet, take on rougher surfaces. When you look at the stone of the pyramid, this is what you see. You see either smooth blocks or very crude blocks. And we have replicated all these surfaces 
just by varying the amount of water, which depends on the climate, it depends on the weather. Joints between blocks are also perfect. It will take three months for the stones to fully cure because of the climate of northern France. In 4,000 years, will future archaeologists insist that our imitation pyramid stones are natural limestone? So you can see from that video that, again, we have an alternative hypothesis that's proposed. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind when we talk about paradigm shifts in technology innovations, they happen because somebody thinks outside the box. They don't accept the, uh, the lens that everybody else views a particular issue from. They look at it from a different angle, and uh, that's how innovation happens. Um, that act actually was supported by another material science, Michelle Barsou of uh, Drexel University and his team. They did a study. Uh, actually a scanning electron microscope examination of uh, some of that block that's used uh, to create pyramids and found that it had some minerals and porosity that don't occur in natural limestone. So there's further evidence, again, that was found that maybe this, uh, maybe these rocks, uh, these pyramids weren't built from rock that was hewn, but rather uh, constructed with concrete. And of course, you know, it's accepted the accepted paradigm that's out there is that these were hewn out of stone. That's what we've been thinking for years. So trying to shift that is very difficult. You can see there's a lot of dispute that's gone on. Uh, this group is in the minority. But again, those are the people that generally move us forward, uh, the people that have a new idea. So um, there's an interesting thing. Now, one of the things that's accepted uh, by, by uh, most people is that the Romans actually did use concrete. Um, they actually started using limestone burned to produce quicklime uh, around 300 BC, so earlier than this time period. But around 27 BC, they actually uh, started mixing that quicklime with the volcanic ash that they found that was in an area called Bazuli, Italy. And that's where the term pozzolan comes from. I'll touch on it a little bit later on one of my slides. Uh, pozzolan is a mineral admixture that's used to enhance concrete. And so that's where that term comes from. That the volcanic ash, which is chemically similar to pozzolan's uh, modern day, uh, was actually found in Pizzuli, Italy, which is where the name came from. Um, so that mortar is combined with fist-sized rocks and shaped or packed into shape to create structures. Chemically, just briefly, calcium carbonate, you add heat, you burn that and produce quicklime, which is calcium oxide, and you have carbon dioxide emission. <laughs> that calcium oxide is combined with water and silicon oxide, which is found in the volcanic ash, uh, to create calcium silicate hydrate, which is one of the three main ingredients in modern day Portland cement, uh, and it's abbreviated CSH. And you can see the chemical uh, uh, molecule there. Now what happens is, let me kind of back up to that slide, what happens is that this calcium silicate hydrate actually goes through a chemical reaction when combined with water, and it actually allows it to harden underneath water. So if you're underwater, it's still going to continue to harden because it's a hydrated material. There's a chemical reaction going on. It's exothermic. Heat is given off. Um, and over time, that material actually hardens. And actually, the presence of water uh, assists with that process. You want to maintain moisture in concrete over time so that it continues to harden. Um, you know, uh, concrete that has been in place for hundreds of years is still hardening today. Uh, as long as there's moisture present because that chemical reaction is continuing. And you can see some of the neat things that were produced using concrete. And again, it's very crude, um, you know, hand, a lot of hand work, a lot of labor intensive work. But you can see the Roman Colosseum where they had a lot of gladiator fights and things like that still standing today. Uh, testament to the durability of the concrete that was used in Rome. 
and a number of other structures, the Roman aqueducts to transport water, uh, moisture in the, uh, into cities and so forth. Um, you can see the Pantheon. And one of the neat things about the Pantheon is the dome of the Pantheon. Again, this is all formed out of concrete, man-made concrete. And you can see the unique design that they're able to produce using concrete. Uh, again, early, as early as BC, before uh, uh, the turn of the uh, turn into uh, AD. So, um, again, it's a very versatile material. Uh, one of the uh, last pieces I'm going to show you from Roman times, as far as construction, is the Baths of Caracalla. I've got a brief video on that. Okay, I'll explain to you what those baths were used for. See some of the actual. I've got a little bit of a hang up here on my video. For some reason it's not downloading. Well, we will uh, possibly come back to that. But you can see in the video here, this is the structure as it, as it exists today. You can see there is some obvious dilapidation over uh, the centuries. Massive baths were built by the Emperor Caracalla in the early 3rd century AD. Over 10,000 Romans could come here every day and enjoy the hot and cold baths, the swimming pools, the libraries, and the public exercise spaces. We often think of Rome as being a hygienic city thanks to baths like these and the aqueducts. In fact, the opposite was the case. Rome was hot, dirty, and crowded, and disease was rampant. One of the reasons why the Emperor Caracalla built baths like these was so that the urban populace could escape the hardships of their everyday lives. We know that Rome was built over a swamp and that malaria was endemic to the population. Combined with poor hygiene, this meant that the average life expectancy at birth was only 20 years. Under these conditions, one would have expected Rome's population to decline. Instead, it grew to a city of one million people in the first century AD, as a steady stream of immigrants came to seek out new opportunities in the imperial capital. So again, you can see some of the amazing benefits that concrete construction provided to early society uh, in the Roman Empire. Now, uh, it was a period of centuries where the Roman concrete formula, formula for making cement, basically, was lost for hundreds of years. So you didn't see a lot of concrete construction during that time because they didn't know how to make cement. Um, but after about 1000 AD, they started to develop uh, those formulas again. And in 1824, uh, a fellow named Joseph Aspton, who was a, a bricklayer from Leeds, England, uh, experimented with various uh, proportions of materials and so forth. And he developed a new formula for something he called Portland cement. Now, the reason it gets its name, and Portland isn't a brand name, that's the common name that we use for modern day cement, and there are a variety of formulas, but Portland cement was named because it resembled the, the product that Joseph Aston produced, uh, produced a material that looked like the natural stone found in the Isle of Portland in England. Again, a lot of the names we have for things come from uh, where things come from, essentially. Um, <laughs> so again, he developed that formula in the early 1800s, um, and they started using that in concrete construction. Um, now these are some of the basic ingredients that are used to produce concrete. Does anybody know what those, any of those are? Anybody? Okay, we have here is a picture of some limestone. Here is some natural clay. And over here is some sand. Those materials are crushed, ground, and proportioned. Uh, Preheater is used to warm up the temperature of those materials for easier production and also to drive off any leftover moisture that's still left at that point. A rotating kiln 
and I'll show pictures of this in a short video as well. Uh, basically increases the temperature as the material moves down this angled kiln that's rotating and eventually it produces something called cement clinker. So I'll show you a picture of that. Over here you see the clinker. Basically looks like small pebbles, generally a rounded shape. You can get some that aren't round that are produced, but generally they're round, small pebbles. Uh, they're producing, you see one here that's pretty hot, and again, temperature goes up to around 3,000 3, degrees Fahrenheit, so it gets very, very hot, which is required to cause the chemical transformations that produce cement. Now that uh, clinker is ground up. Gypsum, which is a naturally occurring element, is added at about uh, an amount of 5%. Now the reason the gypsum is added, if it wasn't added to the cement, the cement would hydrate very quickly and harden very quickly and it wouldn't be workable very long uh, as a, in a concrete mixture. So they add gypsum in small amounts to control that set time and keep it from setting up too quickly so people have time to place it and work it and make it look nice before it hardens, uh, before it begins to cure. You can see down here one of my three dogs. This is gypsum. You can see the similarity uh, between her and, and the gypsum. <coughs> So this is a schematic that kind of just shows the overall process. Uh, cement, a cement plant is a huge investment. It's about a billion dollar overall investment to start a new cement plant. So it's critical that it's located in the right place. And they want to locate it in a place where they have a large supply of naturally occurring limestone. That's critical. Because if they don't, they got to get the limestone to that cement plant, which is using huge amounts of limestone. It's very expensive to transport the material to the plant if it doesn't exist at the site. And there are cases where that has actually happened where they placed a cement plant somewhere and there wasn't as much naturally occurring limestone as they thought. It ended up being very expensive because they have to barge in material uh, to produce the cement. It's a huge expense. So it's critical to have that naturally occurring limestone. They take that, grind it, crush it, and I'll show a video that kind of explains some of this further. Okay, and you can see it gets to finely ground, so it's powder-like. It's proportioned with clay and sand. Ground further, set through the preheater. This is the preheater area. Cement is preheated and then goes into the kiln, and I talked about this a little earlier, an angled kiln. It's rotating very slowly, and the material just gradually moves down and increases in temperature until it gets to the end, comes out at the bottom as clinker, goes through a cooling area, Gypsum is added in proportions, again about 5%. Uh, that's mixed further and that's put into storage silos until it's ready to be used. Um, and I have a brief video. It's about four minutes. Cement is a fine gray powder that's used to make concrete. It's also an ingredient in the mortar that masons use to lay brick and stone. Cement also goes into soil cement, a material that's used in paving roads, building dams, and lining reservoirs. The action begins at the limestone quarry. The limestone near the surface has a high content of the minerals silica, iron, and aluminum oxide. Deeper down, the limestone is more pure, containing less of those minerals and more calcium carbonate. The plant uses both types of rock, altering the proportions to make different types of cement. Workers drill holes in the rock wall in which they plant powerful explosives. For safety, the workers have to position themselves behind the area they're blasting, maintaining a distance of at least 50 meters. After the explosion, loaders move in. They transfer the limestone rocks to 50-ton capacity dump trucks. The trucks then haul their cargo to the cement plant nearby. plant, the trucks dump the rocks into what's called the primary crusher. The rocks can be as big as a piano. The primary crusher reduces them to about the size of softballs. 
There's a constant spray of water to keep the dust from billowing up and settling on the chutes. From there, a conveyor transports the rocks to the secondary crusher. It reduces them further to about the size of golf balls. Rock high in calcium carbonate and rock low in calcium carbonate are crushed separately. Now it's time to mix the two. The ratio varies according to the type of cement they're making. This overhead machine called a tripper makes piles of the required proportions. They call this the raw mix. Then a reclaimer loads the raw mix into a grinding machine called a roller mill. Depending on what minerals are already naturally in the crushed rock, the factory adds extra minerals such as silica and iron. Certain types of cement also require aluminum oxide. The roller mixes and grinds the ingredients uniformly, producing a dry rock powder called the raw meal. Now the powder goes into a preheater. The temperature of the powder is 80 degrees Celsius upon entering. Within 40 seconds, it gets more than 10 times hotter. This begins the process of bonding the minerals together so that they'll later harden when hydrated with water. The preheater is equipped with what's called a flash calcimer. In about five seconds, it removes 95% of the carbon dioxide and the powder through a chemical reaction. This isolates the lime, which is the most important element in cement. From there, the powder moves into a rotary kiln, a huge cylindrical furnace. It's set at an angle so that the powder moves from top to bottom a distance of 49 meters. The kiln rotates about two turns a minute to ensure the material travels through at the right speed. The burner's gas flame at the bottom reaches a scorching 16 to 1700 degrees Celsius. As the powder approaching it reaches the 1500 degree mark, it fuses into pieces about the size of marbles. These pieces are called clinker. As the clinker leaves the kiln, large fans cool it down to between 60 and 80 degrees Celsius. It's important to cool the clinker quickly in order to have quality cement. From here, the clinker goes to the storage area. The last stage of cement making is called finish grinding. They add some gypsum to the clinker. The precise amount varies with the type of cement they're making. Gypsum delays the cement setting time so that it can be worked for up to two hours before hardening. The cement mills are called ball mills because they contain metal balls, about 150 tons of them in the largest mill. As the mill rotates, the balls crush and grind the clinker and gypsum into a fine powder. So that gives you a basic idea of uh, the modern cement making process. One of the things I wanted to point out is how we actually take uh, heat that comes off of that material after it's been produced, the clinker, and is actually brought in and recycled to produce the heat for the preheating area. Um, so again, part of that issue with sustainability and things that we talk about, uh, a very hot topic today, uh, trying to conserve energy, it's economic and it's also you know, good for the environment. So, one of the things I want to touch on just briefly, there's also a number of what we call mineral admixtures, or you see the word again, pozzolan. Uh, again, remember the volcanic ash from Brazuli, Italy. Um, there are a number of different types of pozzolan. You can see a little pile of type 1 Portland cement here. Uh, here's ground granulated glass furnace slag, glass sea fly ash, and silica fume, which are all mineral admixtures that can be added to concrete to enhance its properties. Um, and all three of these are byproducts from other industries. And they actually would go to a landfill if it weren't for being used uh, as a mineral admixture in concrete. So that's a benefit to the environment as well. There are also a number of chemical admixtures. I'm not going to get into that in my discussion today. Uh, but there's a ton of those, <laughs> a lot of those out there. Uh, and a number of different companies that produce liquid chemicals that can be added to change properties in the concrete as well. So now what I want to move on to is, okay, we had this revolution 
in paradigms that happened in the early 1800s, and that really changed the way, you know, through the Industrial Revolution and all those sorts of things that happened, the way that uh, cement is produced and used in concrete construction. You can see uh, one of the local area skylines that people are probably more familiar with, the Chicago skyline, and many of those structures, uh, the skyscrapers that you see in Chicago, were constructed with concrete, and even the ones that are steel-based structures, the foundation upon which that is all built is concrete. So uh, concrete is a huge building material that has literally changed the landscape of our world. Uh, and, and again, it's not just in the local area, a couple other major cities in different parts of the world. You see the Tokyo skyline. Again, this wouldn't be possible without Portland cement. And the third one in Dubai. Again, you can see the skyscraper. I believe this is still currently the tallest building in the world. Uh, it might be, it might not be anymore. Um, <laughs> it changes yearly, it seems like. <clears throat> Again, a lot of uh, awesome things have happened because of concrete production uh, and cement production, essentially, which is uh, the main ingredient in concrete, or the most important ingredient in concrete. And you see, uh, basically I'm going to talk about some of the different ways that concrete is used and, uh, and through pictures kind of exhibit some of these characteristics of concrete that make it so uh, useful today. It's strength, it's durability, versatility, thermal mass, reflectivity, and sustainability of concrete. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about strength. Again, here's an example of a skyscraper. <clears throat> You'll see these all over the world. Again. Uh, you could do this with steel, you could do a steel structure, but you can't build these things without a concrete foundation. So you need that building material regardless of what you use to actually build up the structure. You need the foundation. <coughs> One of the other places where you see strength and durability, well, actually you don't see it because it's underground. Okay? You can see foundation walls that were poured here, again, providing the base for any construction that's built up after that. Septic tanks, which we take for granted. If you have a septic tank, you take it for granted unless it backs up and isn't working, and then it's a problem. Uh, but again, without concrete, how do we build those? It's very difficult. So the septic tanks are built with concrete as well. Some of the other underground construction, concrete pipe. You can see one of the big advantages, strength and durability. You can see it's laying on pipes of other materials. And you can see how they're cr being crushed by the concrete pipe because it's significantly uh, stronger and heavier than those. Um, you know, if you have a huge water washout, a uh, large rainfall, maybe a flood, uh, the concrete pipe is less much less likely to float up and drift away. It's going to continue to function generally uh, because of that large mass of the concrete. And again, the durability is also good. Uh, because it's also a structural member, unlike these, you can put a lo heavy load on it and it will maintain its shape and continue to function properly. You can see here's some, uh, culvert, a culvert. Again, it's conserved not only as a waterway, but also as a structural element uh, that uh, traffic can drive over. One of the other things that's interesting about concrete, uh, concrete is very strong in compression, uh, but it's very weak in tension. It's essentially a ceramic. Um, you take your finger like this and you bend it, and you feel the bottom of your finger, it's being pulled. So that's in tension. The top is being compressed. You can see my knuckle skin. I'm getting older now, too. But, <laughs> so it's really pronounced, but you know the skin on the top of my knuckle is being compressed. The bottom is being stretched. So this is what happens to a, a long concrete beam, let's say, that's being loaded in the center and supported at the two ends. It's going to be stretched like this and this bottom edge is going to be in tension. And again, what did I say about concrete? Good in compression, not good in tension. So as a beam it wouldn't function very well. So because of that we use uh, steel cable to reinforce that concrete. And there's two different approaches, basic approaches that we use. One is what we call pre-stressed or pre-tensioned. We actually stress wire strands um, with significantly high loads, okay? And we hold that there and pour the concrete on top of it, allow it to harden and cure, 
It's accelerated curing. They apply heat and steam through steam to speed up the curing process because it's a production environment and they need to produce beams very quickly for financial reasons. So they raise the strength to a certain level, then they you know, basically release those strands and the strands are held in place through the friction of the surrounding concrete. But that tension of those wires basically holds that beam together and you can see on these beams the pre-stressing strands are down at the bottom of the beam. And that's because, again, that's where the tension of the beam in place is going to see. It's going to see tension in the bottom of the beam. So we want to make sure that the tensile strength is added at the bottom. So that's the reason for the metal strands being at the bottom. Uh, you can see down here, post-tensioning system. There are some YouTube videos out there if you want to see that in action. You basically cast the slab. You got a hole, a through hole in that slab that contains strands metal strands and those are stretched after the concrete is in place. So that's post tension. Uh, again, it's primarily to support bending and tension loads that that uh, material will see uh, in, in place. Because of that capability, it's used for a lot of long span bridges you can see here. A lot of uh, versatility there move into some of that discussion in a little bit. Another cement based product, <laughs> cement based tiles and siding, very durable product, again very versatile, we cast in a lot of different colors and shapes uh, and sizes uh, and it'll basically last a lifetime. Termite resistance, another uh, important issue with regard to durability, you can see a termite there, now, if you have a wood home, you can see it's kind of feeding on some wood right now. You don't want your termite to look like that, okay? So one way to avoid that is to have a concrete home. And you can see how beautiful a concrete home can be. Everybody thinks a concrete home's got to be too, you know, made up of all these straight gray walls. Well, that is certainly not the case today. And it can be cast into any kind of color or shape. Uh, and again, you're going to avoid the issue with termites because they don't like to eat concrete. Disaster resistance, that's another big issue with durability. You can see the one concrete home here, and I don't know if this was a hurricane or a tornado, but you can see all the other homes are removed from their foundations. The concrete foundations are all still in place. One concrete home stands alone uh, after that disaster. Same thing here, again, another concrete home after that disaster, wind, hurricanes, tornadoes. Fire resistance is also excellent and there's a lot of testing that's done with concrete either poured in place concrete or concrete block to test its uh, resistance to heat. Um, my father-in-law actually had a photo and I didn't have don't have a copy of it here today uh, uh, but in the Philippines when he was stationed there there was a huge field and a set of concrete steps sat alone in that field the only thing that's left after a huge fire burnt down all the straw homes and that the set of stairs was sitting out there by itself. Again, a testament to concrete's durability. Versatility. It's a very versatile material. Now here's another example of versatility. If you've seen the movie Zoolander, you can see Magnum and then a little bit softer look, Ferrari. You know, he's got a lot of versatility, doesn't he? Let's watch a video on I this. I just have a few more questions, if that's okay. Cool. So when did you know you wanted to be a model? Hmm, I guess it would have to be the first time I went through the second grade. I caught my reflection in the spoon while I was eating my cereal, and I remember thinking, wow, you're ridiculously good looking. Maybe you could do that for a career. Do what? Be professionally good looking. Right. What would you say your trademark is, if you have one? Well, I guess the look I'm best known for is blue steel. What's that look like? It's impressive. And that is Ferrari and the Tigra. The Tigra's a lot softer. It's a little bit uh, more of a catalog look. I use it for footwear sometimes. Can I see that? Derek Zoolander, may 
male modeling wouldn't be what it is today. He is a fashion icon. So do you spend a lot of time working on these looks, thinking about them? Oh, sure. I've been working on Magnum for at least the last eight or nine years. Magnum? That's intriguing. Can I see that? Are you kidding? I shouldn't even be talking about it. It's nowhere near ready. It's almost like there's a light around him, and he exudes beauty. I think about Derek every time I design a collection. Uh, Derek, I don't know if you're familiar with the belief that some Aboriginal tribes hold. It's the concept that a photo might steal a part of your soul. I and mean, what are your thoughts on that as someone gets his picture taken for a living? That blue steel let me down. Oh my gosh, he's styling. So, uh, again, the Magnum, you can see, was the culmination of that movie, uh, and you can see the versatility there. Thankfully, concrete has more versatility than Derek Zoolander. Uh, and you can see a piece right here, the Falkirk wheel, it's in Scotland, and actually is used to rotate and lift ships. And you can see the different vessels here. This can actually rotate and lift ships. Um, you can see the versatility in the fact that you know all the geometric shapes that can be produced with concrete is extremely versatile. Architects love it because they can produce any shape basically, so they can let their imagination fly, and you can see a lot of unique curves and things like that uh, in various architectural pieces. It's versatile from the standpoint of getting it to the job site. You can see you know a ready mix truck here that's commonly used to transport concrete. Now they have pump trucks. They actually pump the concrete for use in above grade floors typically. Um, they can also actually have, you know, if it's a very high building, large high rise let's say, they actually have an in place pump that's built that pumps it up multiple floors uh, if, if the boom truck, the pump truck doesn't have the capability of reaching that high. But again, these are of course getting bigger and bigger over time and better and better capabilities. Another uh, testament to the versatility of concrete, another application is a tilt-up concrete construction. They actually pour walls on an existing slab and tilt them into place. And you can see the crane here and the bracing that's put in place to hold that wall. And you see, okay, it's plain gray concrete wall, nothing, nothing big, it's a neat construction method. But then you start to see some of the unique architectural features that can be added to that. And you don't just produce straight walls, square buildings that have a gray color. You don't have to go paint them. You can actually put you know, a facade material like a brick look and you pour the concrete slab on top of that and you lift it into place. It's a brick wall, essentially. You can see here some colors, some staining and shapes were added. Architectural features here, that's again an example of a tilt-up wall. And here are some of the final products. Your Best Buy stores, most of them are built using tilt-up construction. There's another facility. And then finally you see this one again, doesn't have to be square shaped. You can have rounded features using tilt-up. So that's a testament to versatility. Again you see different facades and colors and so forth. Another uh, opportunity for versatility is decorative concrete. Stains and stamping is used to produce concrete that looks like something else. It might look like stone, might look like wood, okay? Um, you can add a gloss finish to it. You see some stain there, patterns, various patterns and shapes. You can be as creative as you want to be and produce concrete that looks like just about anything. A lot of the zoos you go to these days, the trees manufactured Disney Disney World. A lot of the stuff is manufactured with concrete. Looks like a tree, but it's not. It's it's concrete. Concrete countertops. That's another popular item these days. A lot of people aren't aware of that. And you see an example here of it being poured. You've got some reinforcement in there to help with the tensile strength. And the concrete's being poured in there. And you see it's not gray. It's colored concrete. It's brown in that case. And you got a lot of different architectural features that you can have, and you can have any shape you want, essentially. Uh, the concrete can be formed that way. Colors, any color you want, okay? It's a lot of uh, opportunities for versatility with concrete countertops, and that's getting to be a big business anymore. 
<laughs> Another neat thing is the reflectivity of concrete. Because of its color, gray, lighter, rather than an asphalt parking lot, if you have a concrete parking lot, you can afford to use less intense lighting or maybe use less lighting and still get the same reflectance in that parking lot for safety reasons, for energy efficiency reasons. So there's a lot of pluses to that reflectivity. Also used in rooftops, it's lighter colored, has higher reflectivity, it doesn't contribute as much to what we call the heat island effect that you see in a lot of major cities where darker roofs are absorbing heat. Um, and basically that heat island effect is a detriment to ozone in those cities. So uh, concrete can assist with that as well. Uh, another example of sustainability is a product called pervious concrete. And that's essentially concrete produced without any sand. So you've got cement, water, stone or aggregate, and you don't have fine aggregate. You only have the coarse, which is the stone, the coarse stone. You don't have any sand, so that concrete essentially has a bunch of gaps in it. So when you pour water in, it goes all the way through. Why is that important? Well, again, for water control uh, during the rains and things like that, the water can actually drain right there. It doesn't have to be directed towards some catch basin or something to get, gather the water. The other neat thing about that is they're actually doing studies now where they have shown that the pH actually lowers. So if you've got an acid rain issue, which is a common problem, uh, water comes in and the pH is actually changed to make it more of a base, less acidic as it comes through that concrete. And, you know, again, you've got versatility. You can do different colors. You see some hand placement here. It's being placed and rolled into shape here. This is a picture you can see it's really dark because it was taken at night. Uh, this is a uh, ABG paper, okay? Um, this, uh, basically the concrete, the previous concrete comes in there and it's a compacting paper that actually produces, you know, pavement in a more efficient way than, you know, doing it by hand like you see here. So a number of companies are producing larger paving surfaces using automated equipment. So again, just to reiterate, uh, you know, because of that invention of Portland cement, it allowed us to produce concrete in a much more efficient way and uh, change the landscape of the world we live in and uh, give us a lot of opportunities because of these characteristics of concrete. Um, are there any questions? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for your time. It is a main ingredient of making concrete, and uh, this uh, invention revolutionized the construction world. So let me talk about that a little bit today. First thing I'm going to do is give a little bit of a history of concrete construction and how it happened over time in the early years. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the development of Portland cement and the time period that that happened and then give you an idea of the breadth of applications of cement based products, primarily concrete, but it's also used in other applications as well, um, and give you an opportunity to ask any questions. So. One of the things that everybody's aware of is the pyramids. And there's a long-standing accepted belief that these uh, pyramids were constructed of stone that was hewn, that was quarried and hewn uh, in Egypt. So I'll give you an idea of what the mainstream theory is of pyramid construction. In the theory video, we showed the basic principles of getting the massive limestone blocks from the quarry all the way up to the pyramid construction site and then up the side of the pyramid using flotation in simplistic terms. But in reality, if a water lift extended from the ground to the top of the pyramid with only a gate at the top and at the bottom, the water lift would break because of the huge pressures created by the weight of so much water. 
combat this, Chris proposes multiple gated locks in 50 foot segments, extending up the water shaft. The upshot of doing this is that each section... Basically he says that those blocks were actually made out of concrete rather than hewn out of stone. So they took soft limestone with a very high kaolinite content. Now, kaolinite is basically a clay. So I had a high clay content, and those are mixed with lime and natron. Now I'm gonna play a short video that describes a little bit about this theory um, and uh, shows how it uh, has potential validity. In September of 2002, our Geopolymer Institute crew cast massive imitation pyramid blocks. Or perhaps you should say genuine pyramid blocks. We used the same kind of earthen ingredients available to the ancient Egyptians 4,500 years ago. These massive blocks have the same chemical makeup and appearance as blocks of the Great Pyramid. The limestone we used consists of fossil shells called pneumidites, like those in the Giza bedrock. Like in Giza, our French limestone is so loosely bound it doesn't require crushing. But unlike in Giza, it contains no kaolin clay. We heap the cement additives, lime, natron and kaolin clay, near the limestone. The two components will react in the water and will in situ uh, geological glue, which will then yield <coughs> the hard geopolymeric rock agglomerated limestone. We start making the cement by mixing sodium carbonate, found in Egyptian natron, and lime in 500 liters of water. We then add the kaolin, inherent to Giza limestone, and stir the mix with a wooden tool. We dump one ton of limestone rubble into the basin and mix it. Well, concrete is a word that we use a lot in our lives. And the origin of the word, I wouldn't tell you what the origin is in the original language, but uh, uh, if you Google it or go to a dictionary, you'll find that's kind of bringing things together in a sound and strong concrete. And we still use it even outside of uh, materials and engineering in sound and concrete ideas or foundational uh, theologies or uh, ideologies or whatever. But today we are into the real application of concrete in construction. And uh, this presentation is a part of revolutions in science and technology paradigms. Now, uh, this is part of the first Eastern Illinois University uh, Symposium on Technology and Society. And I am sure you will in concretely uh, enjoy this presentation presented by the chair of the School of Technology at Eastern Illinois University, Dr. Austin Cheney. He is my chair also. I work at the School of Technology. So without much ado, please welcome Dr. Austin Cheney, Concrete. Thank Dr. Wuf I want to thank Dr. Wafiq Wabi for the opportunity to present here today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, revolution in science and technology that happened because of the development of Portland cement. So it's a concrete advantage, as we know, cement... ...would we'll only be subjected to about two bars of water pressure. Also, this would decrease the compression of the floats used to lift the blocks of the shaft. Blocks would be continually moved upwards in threes and fours between each set of locks.
the blocks arrive at the top of the pyramid construction site, ready for placement. So you can see one theory that's been proposed and widely accepted actually. You find that a lot in your education that oftentimes theories that we've come up with and there's not proof of that theory are presented as if they're fact. Theory of evolution is a perfect example. It's taught in the classroom as fact. They're disputing alternative hypotheses out there. Similarly, with the pyramids, there is an alternate hypothesis proposed uh, by a fellow by the name of Joseph Davidovitz. <laughs> and uh, it's with the cement. Several days later, water has evaporated from the basin, so we remove the disaggregated limestone for making the block. Inspecting the mixture, 95% limestone aggregates and only 5% rock making binder. Between 12 and 17% of water give it the consistency of wet sand. One squeezes the mixture with his hand and it keeps its shape. This batch will quickly gain strength. We do all of the work manually, forming a human shape, carrying buckets from the mixing area to the mold. We pour the limestone concrete mixture in a mold and pack it down with a tool called a rammer. Compacting the material requires little effort. The packing operation encourages cohesion and the denser mixture takes on high strength from the initial curing phase. When the climate is warm and beautiful, our crew rapidly produces a reagglomerated limestone that proved strong, dense and true to the plant's size and shape. The mold consists of small wooden boards, which can be reused many times for making other blocks. In this ideal weather, the whole process runs smoothly and is very simple. We remove the mold four hours later. The synthetic limestone looks like a natural stone. We observe no trace of wood grain.